Hi, Room 15. This is Chapter 16, The Maze. During the days that followed, our lives fell into a pattern, and the reason for our captivity gradually became clear. Dr. Schultz was a neurologist, that is, an expert on brains, nerves, intelligence, and how people learn things. He hoped, by experimenting on us, to find out whether certain injections could help us learn more or faster. And faster. The two younger people working with him, George and Julie, were graduate students in biology. Watch always, he told them, for signs of improvement, faster learning, quicker reaction in group A as compared to group B, and both as compared to the control group. My own training began on the day after the first injections. It was George who did it. I suppose Julie and Dr. Schultz were doing the same test on other rats. He took my cage from the shelf and carried it into another room, similar to the first one but with more equipment on it, and no shelves of cages. He placed the cage in a slot against the wall, slid open the end, opened a matching door in the wall, and I was free. Or so I thought. The small doorway in the wall seemed into, led into a short corridor, which opened, or seemed to, directly into a green lawn. I could, see it, I could see it clearly, and behind it some bushes, and behind them a street, all outdoors, and nothing but air between me and them. Furthermore, I could smell the fresh outdoor breeze blowing in. Were they letting me go? I made a dash toward the open end of the corridor and then jumped back. I could not go on. About two feet from my cage, still open behind me, there was something dreadfully wrong with the floor. When I touched my feet to it, a terrible prickling feeling came over my skin. My muscles cramped, my eyes blurred, and I got instantly dizzy. I never got used to that feeling. No one ever does. But I did experience it many times and eventually learned what it was. Electric shock. It was not exactly a pain, but it is unbearable. Yet I was in a frenzy to reach the open lawn, to run for the bushes, to get away from the cage. I tried again and jumped back again. No use. Then I saw, leading off to the left, another corridor. I had not noticed it at first because I had been so eagerly, I had been looking so eagerly at the open end of the one I was in. The second one seemed to stop about five feet away in the blank wall. Yet there was a light there. It must turn a corner. I ran down it cautiously, not trusting the floor. At the end it turned right. And there was the lawn again, another opening. I got closer this time. Then, just as I thought I was going to make it, another shock. I pulled back and saw that there was still another corridor, leading off to the right. Again I ran. Again I saw the open escape hole, and again I, stopped, I was stopped by the shock. This was repeated over and over, yet each time I seemed to get a little closer to freedom. But when finally I did reach it, and the grass was only a step away, a wire wall snapped down in front of me, another behind me. The ceiling opened above me and a gloved hand reached in and picked me up. A voice said, four minutes, 37 seconds. It was George. I had, after all, my running through the corridor emerged into a trap only a, feet, a few feet from where I had started. And through a concealed opening up above, George had been watching everything that I did. I had been in what is called a maze, a device to test intelligence and memory. I was put in it many times again and so were the others. The second time I got through a little bit faster because I remembered to some extent which corridors had electric floors and which ones did not. The third time I was still faster and each after each child, George, or sometimes Julie, sometimes Dr. Schultz, would write down how long it took. You might ask, why would I bother to run through this at all if I knew it was only a trick? The answer is, I couldn't help it. When you've lived in a cage, you, cannot bear, you can't bear not to run, even if what you're running towards is an illusion. There are more injections and other kinds of tests, and some of these were more important than the maze, because the maze was designed only to find out how quickly we could learn, while some of the others actually taught us things, or at least led to actual teaching. One was what Dr. Schultz called the shape recognition. We would, put, we would be put into a small room with three doors leading out, one round, one square, and one triangle. Triangular. These doors were on hinges with springs that held them shut, so they were easy to push open and each door led into another room, three more doors like the first one. But the trick was, if you went through the wrong door, the room you entered had an electric floor, and you got a shock, so you had to learn. In the first room, you used the round door, second room, triangle, and so on. All of these activities helped to pass the time. The weeks went by quickly, but they did not lessen our longing to get away. I wished for my old home in the storm sewer. I wish I could see my mother and father and run with my brother to the marketplace. I know all of the others felt the same way, yet it seemed a hopeless thing. Still, there was one rat who decided to try it anyway. He was a young rat, probably the youngest of, that had been caught, and by chance he was in the cage next to mine. I might mention that like Jenner and me, he was in group Dr. Schultz called A. His name was Justin. 
It was late one night when I heard him calling to me, speaking softly, around the wooden partition between our cages. Those partitions generally kept us all from getting to know each other as well as we might have done, and discouraged us from talking to one another. It was quite hard to hear around them, and of course you could never see the one you were talking to. I think Dr. Schultz had purposely had them made of some soundproof material, but you could hear if you and your neighbor got in the corners of the cages nearest each other and spoke through the wire front. Nicodemus? Yes, I went over to the corner. How long have you been here? You mean since the beginning, since we were caught? Yes. I don't know, several months, I think, but there's no way to keep track. I know, I don't either. Do you suppose it's winter outside now? Probably, or late fall. Um, it will be cold. Yeah, but not in here. No, but I'm going to try and get out. Get out? But how? Your cage is shut. Tomorrow we get injections, so they'll open it. When they do, I'm going to run. Run where? I don't know. At least I'll get a look around. There might be some way out. What can I lose? You might get hurt. I don't think so. Anyway, they won't hurt me. By they, he meant Dr. Schultz and the other two. He added confidently, All of these slots, all the time they've spent, were too valuable to them now. They'll be careful. That idea had not occurred to me before, but when I thought about it, I decided he was right. Dr. Schultz, Julie, and George had spent most of their working hours with us for months. They could not afford to let any harm come to us. On the other hand, neither could, afford, neither could they afford to allow any of us to escape. Justin made his attempt the next morning, and it did cause a certain amount of excitement, but not at all what we had expected. It was Julie who opened Justin's cage with a hypodermic needle in her hand. Justin was out with a mighty leap, hit the floor about four feet down. With a thump, shock himself, shook himself and ran, disappearing from view, heading toward the other end of the room. Julie seemed not at all to be alarmed. She calmly placed the needle on the shelf, then walked to the door of the laboratory and pushed the button on the wall near it. A red light came on over the door. She picked up a notebook and pencil from the desk near the door and followed Justin out of my sight. A few minutes later, Dr. Schultz and George entered. They opened the door cautiously and closed it behind them. The outer door is shut too, said Dr. Schultz. Where is it? Down here, said Julie, inspecting the air ducts. Really? Which one is it? It's one of the A group, just as you expected. Number nine. I'm keeping notes on it. Obviously, the red white is some corn of warning signal, both outside the door and in. Laboratory animal at large. And not only had Dr. Schultz known one of us was out, but he had expected it to happen. A few days sooner than I thought, he said, who was saying, but so much better. Do you realize? Look, said Julie. He's doing the whole baseboard, and he's studying the windows, too. See how he steps back to look up? Of course, said Dr. Schultz, and at the same time he's watching us, too. Can't you see? He's pretty cool about it, said George. Can you imagine one of the lab rats doing that, or even one of the controls? We've got to try to grasp what we have in our hands. The A group is now the A group is now 300% ahead of the control group in learning and getting smarter all the time. B group is only 20% ahead. It's the new DNA that's doing it. We have a real breakthrough, and since it's DNA, we may very well have a true mutation, a brand new species of rat, but we've got to be careful with it. I think we should go ahead now with the next injection series. The steroids? Whatever that meant. Yes, it may slow them up a little bit, though I doubt it, and even if it does, it'll be worth it, because I'm betting it will increase their lifespan by double at least, maybe more, maybe much more. Look, said Julie, A9 has made a discovery. He's found the mice. George said, see how he's studying them? Probably, said Dr. Schultz Riley. He's wondering if they're, ready, if they're ready for their steroid injections, too. As a matter of fact, I think Group G is. They're, almost as well, they're doing almost as well as Group A. Should I get to the net and put him back, George said. I doubt you'll need it, Dr. Schultz. Now he's learned he can't get out. But they were underestimating Justin. He had learned no such thing. All right, go fill out that Google form.